morning, everybody. Um, thanks for coming out to the government session first thing in the morning. Um, we'll have a lot of <laughs> exciting stuff to tell you. Um, uh, as I understand the schedule, it's going to be um, presentations uh, mostly focused on um, the uh, National QIS Research Centers, which are um, the five uh, NQI centers uh, that are run by the Department of Energy. Um, so I'll be uh, kicking things off, try to give a high-level overview about you know what the the broader picture is. Um, yep. Um, so I'll be telling you this morning about one of the five centers. Uh, the center is called um, SQMS, uh, which stands for <laughs> the Superconducting Quantum Materials and Systems uh, Center. Um, so I actually um, uh, might be the only one in this session um, speaking today who doesn't have a primary government affiliation. Um, I'm actually at a startup uh, in the Bay Area called Rigetti. Um, we're kind of a, a deep uh, you know, partner in this uh, NQI center, and um, uh, I'll you know tell you a little bit about what we're up to. But it'll be mostly focused on uh, the work that, that's happening at Fermilab and across across the center. So that is to say that um, uh, my opinions uh, neither represent uh, Rigetti nor uh, the government. Um, so you know, quantum right now is in a really interesting place where. Um, over the last couple years, uh, lab-scale demonstrations have started to grow in complexity, um, you know, from academic and, and, and other labs, um, and starting to kind of grow towards commercialization and, and towards larger-scale systems. Um, Fermilab is a really unique place within, uh, you know, the, the research uh, ecosystem because uh, they do really, really big science, right? So um, Fermilab is uh, one of the flagship high energy physics labs. Um, so if you ever get a chance to, to get a tour out there in Chicago, um, you get to see these, these incredible machines. And so in a lot of ways, the dawn of like big quantum uh, is going to leverage a lot of the techniques that have been pioneered in the kind of big physics era, right? Because ultimately big quantum computers are big physics machines. Um, so the journey at Fermilab is um, you know, they've, they have a ton of uh, expertise at kind of big, uh, big system integration, um, you know, big physics uh, systems. Um, but even more interestingly, um, some of the components that go into modern um, uh, particle accelerators actually have direct applications in QIS science. Um, and that's uh, another thing that we'll be telling you about. So this is um, part of a beamline that will get installed um, at uh, the Stanford Linear Accelerator. Um, and uh, so this is, a, this is called a, a, a cryo module. And um, we'll see kind of the insides of, of this in a little bit and how it relates to, to QIS. So again, you know, still very big, um, getting uh, a little bit smaller than that uh, Tevatron, uh, you know, particle collider detector. Um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of pictures of Fermilab stuff, you'll see humans for scale. Um, and so as a, <laughs> You know, um, quantum computing startup, it's always fun to uh, see, see such massive um, equipment. So um, if you actually look inside of these uh, cryo modules, um, these are comprised of several of these uh, little microwave cavities. And so in uh, particle physics, to build an accelerator, uh, what you end up doing is you store lots and lots of uh, microwave energy uh, that kind of sloshes around in these cavities. And as uh, fundamental particles fly through here, uh, they get a kick from the, the microwave energy uh, that, that's bouncing around in this cavity. So you can imagine you know, electrons, protons, uh, zipping through these uh, down the barrel at very close to the speed of light. Um, uh, it turns out that in the quantum limit, um, instead of driving the cavities like super duper hard, um, uh, you can actually store uh, quantum information uh, in that same mode. So in order to make uh, particle accelerators, uh, these superconducting cavities have to be you know, nearly lossless. And that's the same property uh, that we want to take advantage of uh, in quantum computing uh, to, to avoid decoherence, right? So this is actually um, uh, one of these particle accelerator cavities. Um, if you see the bottom of this picture, 
Um, you know, quantum computing has been around uh, enough that a lot of you have seen these kind of chandeliers. There are these dilution refrigerators. So th this cavity is actually bolted uh, to one of these dilution refrigerators to be operated at, at 10 millikelvin um, uh, and, and start to kind of be uh, kind of uh, controlled in, in a quantum mechanical sense. Um, so this was really kind of the foundation of, of this NQI center was this uh, kind of growing interest at, at Fermilab uh, to, to leverage um, some of these techniques that they've developed for, for particle accelerators and apply those to, to QIS. Um, something that really kind of starts to make it look like uh, a really interesting center is um, this, this rod uh, is actually a very long piece of uh, silicon. And uh, so it's, it's actually a silicon chip uh, with a qubit at one end. Um, and uh, Rigetti made that qubit um, at, our, um, at our fab in, in Fremont, California, just down the road. Um, and so by combining uh, these very, very high Q cavities uh, with high quality you know, manufactured superconducting qubits, that kind of opens up a new uh, paradigm for control. Um, and so you know, Fermilab is, is very interested in uh, you know, understanding how to start to control these, these accelerator cavities uh, through the tools of, of QIS and to understand the basic science thereof. This is really kind of uh, the heart of the center. Um, so just taking a step back, um, since the, um, <laughs> the whole session today uh, is based on these national QIS research centers, um, not assuming that you know uh, what they are, I um, just want to give a quick uh, summary of, of kind of how all of these pieces fit together. Um, and uh, credit to uh, Irfan Siddiqui for, for these summaries. Uh, I'm not gonna read all of it. Uh, <laughs> uh, I think if we were still virtual, I would just kind of you know, walk away and, and get a coffee while you read this slide. Um, the point uh, that I wanna make is that you know, these are new. Um, they really launched uh, within the last year or so, um, and they're really just starting to produce you know, the first science um, out of these you know, major collaborations they're all kind of you know, multi-lab, uh, lot, lots of academics. So that is to say, uh, lo lots of exciting things that you'll hear about today. Um, another theme that you'll see throughout uh, these talks, hopefully, um, is this idea of an innovation chain. So these centers really you know, across the board span uh, fundamental science, uh, making improved devices, small-scale systems, prototypes, and applications of, of QIS science. So you should see you know, a number of uh, exciting themes uh, throughout this, this session. Um, there's five centers. Um, you'll be hearing uh, from four of them today. Um, and so I'll let everyone uh, present their own center, but you know, these are the logos um, and I'm, uh, from SQMS. So uh, the mission statement for SQMS uh, is to bring together the power of national labs, industry, and academia to achieve transformational advances in the major cross-cutting challenges of understanding and eliminating decoherence mechanisms in superconducting 2D and 3D devices with the goal of establishing the construction and deployment of superior quantum systems for computing and sensing. Hard to condense that, um, but you know, our acronym is four letters, so we, we have some space. Um, and uh, you know, what you'll see you know, throughout this talk, hopefully, is a combination of um, you know, uh, industry, uh, academia, and national labs uh, working together. Um, in terms of the uh, focal point of the center that really drives um, a lot of the kind of cross-cutting initiatives in the center um, is that we're really hoping through SQMS uh, to uh, advance the state of the art of quantum computing prototypes. Um, in particular, by improving the materials um, as well as some of the issues around the scalability of superconducting systems uh, the hope is to really push you know, deep uh, into uh, the, the classically intractable era and towards you know, the, the fault tolerant uh, era of, of quantum computing. So uh, super exciting. Um, one thing that you'll note is that there's actually uh, two different ways um, to make a superconducting uh, qubit system. Uh, the first was the, the pictures that I was showing you with these cavities uh, manipulating quantum states in, in these 3D resonators. Another are the kind of uh, standard uh, you know, 2D processors uh, that Rigetti uh, manufactures and deploys over the cloud. Uh, what's really fun, uh, as you'll see, is that there's a, there's a lot of interplay um, in these systems. So we can really kind of push both. 
Um, the collaboration is 20 plus uh, institutions. Uh, the main ones are kind of uh, in, in the first line here. Um, and uh, yeah, it's a, it's a very uh, fun uh, collaboration. Uh, it's also, uh, you know, crosses uh, all kinds of time boundaries. Uh, it's, it's one of the few NQI centers that also has an international presence. Um, so Fermilab again is uh, the high energy physics, you know, flagship has a number of uh, deep collaborations with Europe. Um, so it's, it's exciting to get some uh, kind of international cooperation uh, towards these goals. Uh, yep. So I'll tell you a little bit about um, kind of how the center uh, divides up expertise uh, across the various uh, folks. So um, here's a, a kind of a deeper picture of, of one of these cryo modules. In order to uh, you know, make a particle accelerator where the particles kind of fly from one end to the other, uh, it has to be you know, high vacuum, uh, low loss. There's lots of uh, RF engineering um, that goes into creating these standing waves. Um, so there's just a ton of uh, engineering and, and, and really technician and, and high precision manufacturing expertise um, that, that's been uh, achieved. Um, and what's, what's really exciting is that um, a lot of this expertise um, ports over both to um, these uh, future 3D systems that the Fermilab is developing, uh, as well as the, the kind of 2D systems that, that are kind of available in these, these commercial quantum computers. Um, now, why is it um, super interesting from an architecture perspective it really comes down to uh, how low loss these cavities are. Um, so, uh, you know, a typical, you know, good uh, transmon qubit and, and supergraphic qubits can live for maybe 100 microseconds. Um, with, with Fermilab's really uh, kind of 30, 40 years expertise in making these uh, niobium systems, we can actually make a memory uh, which in principle can couple to, uh, to supergraphic qubits uh, that can live for two seconds, right? And so that's, that's orders of magnitude uh, longer as a quantum memory um, uh, then we can kind of synthesize on these 2D processors. Um, so, you know, looking out, um, you know, pretty far, um, there's, there's really interesting applications for uh, repeaters, for quantum networks, um, and other kind of quantum memory systems uh, for, for future quantum computers. Um, so, you know, so we're building off of uh, Fermilab's expertise. Uh, as one of these NQI centers, uh, we also have uh, Ames Lab, uh, who's, a, who's a really deep partner, um, and they're really applying some, some really deep materials expertise and, and tooling to, to understand um, decoherence properties in qubits, right? So uh, we all know that uh, you know, quantum states are fragile. What often scrambles that is actually materials defects. Um, so we're really applying a, the, you know, the kitchen sink of, of state-of-the-art tools uh, at Ames to, to really investigate these, these thin films. Um, and they're looking at both, um, you know, uh, chips and uh, systems that are uh, built at Fermilab as well as at Rigetti. Um, so, you know, we're, 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 uh, as an as industry partner, uh, been, been super open about um, helping folks, you know, reproduce recipes and uh, look under the microscope. Uh, NIST has um, uh, developed a test bed over the last several years uh, through partnerships with Keysight, Google, and others. Um, and so we're actually uh, you know, doing a number of uh, very open source uh, characterization uh, and, and kind of data collection uh, investigations uh, that are really trying to push the state of the art of, of quantum characterization of, of these devices. Uh, finally, switching to, to academia, um, we're kind of going uh, even, you know, uh, closer to the atom by atom picture of decoherence for superconducting qubits uh, with, with tools like atom probe tomography uh, simulations and, and kind of deep theory expertise. Um, particular Northwestern uh, has, a, has a pretty big program uh, within SQMS. Um, they have um, uh, not only uh, some of the most advanced um, uh, kind of atom probe and uh, uh, STEM uh, expertise, but another thing that they're doing um, as part of the center, which I think is a, a common theme within the QI centers, um, is, is really starting to look at um, uh, the behavior of these films under uh, x-rays and, and really bright x-ray sources uh, as well. 
Um, finally, uh, you know, I mentioned this uh, you know, a few times, um, uh, the, the films that are uh, under investigation, a lot of them uh, involve you know, process steps at, at an industrial scale fab down in Fremont. Um, that's actually really important for superconducting qubits because reproducibility is a key bottleneck to, to really understanding what's going on. Essentially, the variance from device to device can actually be sometimes, you know, the variance can be much, much larger than the effect that you're looking for when you're making small kind of manufacturing changes. Um, so lots of kind of SQMS uh, wafers are, are moving through our fab every day. Um, and another thing that um, uh, you'll see is, as part of the center is um, there's actually this whole uh, effort on understanding quantum control, right? So it's not just about the noise, it's can you control the noise? Can you run algorithms over a noisy machine? And um, so uh, we're also partnering on um, running algorithms uh, on, on Rigetti machines through the cloud. Um, so, you know, hopefully that gives you a sense of, um, you know, from materials discovery all the way through, through systems uh, integration, how these, you know, major cross-cutting goals of actually making prototype systems really starts to drive, um, you know, a consolidated effort uh, that spans uh, academia, uh, industry, and, and national labs. Um, to really get you know, a click uh, deeper into the kinds of activities that are ongoing at the center, um, this is kind of how we're, we're organized. Um, so there's uh, four, fo four focus areas, um, uh, specifically you know, materials, devices, uh, quantum physics and sensing, and, and algorithm simulations and benchmarking. So I'll give you a quick overview of what each of those, those thrusts are doing, and each one you know, is order, you know, 20 PIs or so. Um, so, you know, I mentioned these materials. Uh, what are some of the things that we're looking at for superconducting qubits? Um, a lot of it has to do with um, uh, defects at uh, materials interfaces, uh, as well as the bulk. Um, our goals are to, to really push um, the lifetime of these cavities from, from two seconds up to 10 seconds, uh, which is a break-even point for certain architectures as well as uh, pushing, pushing transmons that go into these processors really up to the millisecond level. That's a really important um, uh, kind of uh, milestone because the gate times in superconducting qubits are about you know, tens of nanoseconds. So this millisecond barrier is, is really you know, deep within the, the thresholds that we need for quantum error correction. Um, so essentially, you know, every incremental improvement in lifetime uh, has some, some exponential benefit in terms of overhead for, for error correction. So it's, um, it's pretty awesome. Um, now, uh, we kind of are, are starting to understand, uh, you know, what we're up against uh, with some of these materials over the last um, uh, 10, 20 years of, of doing superconducting qubits research. Um, but what's really exciting about this moment in time for superconducting qubits is that um, the material science community uh, is really engaging for the first time uh, ever <laughs> in the last couple of years. Um, and uh, so it's a very exciting time to be, be looking at these films. Uh, things like being able to reproduce uh, films under certain conditions. Um, yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna learn a lot. Um, and uh, I'll give you a preview of, of what we're seeing so far. Um, and yeah, so uh, we're looking at um, not only how to push the materials to the limits, but also looking at environmental factors of decoherence, including radiation, cosmic rays. You may have heard a little bit about that uh, in, in the Google talk yesterday. Um, uh, we have test beds that are uh, deep underground that are kind of very unique in the world uh, where we'll be looking at kind of pushing the limits of, of kind of quiet and uh, very low temperature device behavior. Yep, um, and then there's this just like totally awesome uh, effort within the center where, you know, uh, as a quantum computing startup, you know, uh, very much like focused on, you know, the, the, uh, the really kind of clear applications and, and deliverables. Um, there's this whole other, you know, world at Fermilab, which is really trying to understand, you know, the basic properties of the universe. And one of the really exciting things for me is that every once in a while I get to like, uh, you know, help out with a dark matter experiment. <laughs> that's, just, that's just really fun to do. Um, so, you know, basically these uh, QIS sensors uh, for dark matter are, are very interesting because you can engineer um, uh, systems that are, uh, you know, very, very sensitive to perturbations. 
um, or, or very, very small signals, right? Um, so some of these uh, searches include looking for signal that's encoded in a single microwave photon, which is an incredibly small energy scale. Um, so we're using QIS technologies and techniques uh, to, really, to really probe uh, fundamental uh, science. Uh, finally, uh, the work that's being uh, done at the algorithms layer informs um, some, some of the work that's actually happening with these devices. In particular, uh, folks are, are trying to understand how to design and run algorithms on these uh, 3D cavity systems. Uh, and in order to do that, we're using access uh, through the cloud on Rigetti systems to emulate some of the, the, the device properties of these uh, 3D systems. So it's kind of a, a kind of co-design process where we're using available processors to try to understand future architectures, um, as well as kind of understand um, how such systems can be used to explore uh, unanswered questions in, in high energy physics and, and field theories in condensed matter. Um, yep, finally, uh, we have um, uh, another kind of uh, task within uh, all of these uh, NQIS research centers um, uh, which is to, to really uh, cooperate with uh, the rest of the um, ecosystem uh, within quantum. That's why we're here at Q2B uh, with, with a relatively large presence so that we can understand and uh, engage with you know, industry and um, also you know, take that feedback and, and inform a, a research path. Um, finally, uh, at SQMS, um, this past year, uh, we launched the Carolyn uh, B. Parker Fellowship uh, postdoc for underrepresented uh, minorities. Um, and it's a, it's a really exciting program. Um, and uh, the intent is to run it uh, every year of the center. Um, so it's, uh, it's open now and uh, definitely encourage folks to apply. The five-year vision um, at Fermilab is, is really quite ambitious, spanning um, you know, new foundries for material science as well as these test beds. Hopefully you've, you've gotten a sense of that. Um, but already today, um, having started the centers you know, barely a year ago, um, we're already starting to see um, some of these um, uh, ideas that we had. You know, you know, Fermilab understands superconductivity. Like, let's, let's see if we can understand the superconductivity of, of uh, transmons a little better. Um, that, um, that hypothesis is already starting to, uh, to bear fruit. So I just want to give uh, you know, a quick overview of, of, of some of that science. Um, it's the government track and not the technical track, but you know, hopefully you know, I'm getting a little technical. Um, so uh, the story is that um, over the last uh, 10 or so years in, um, and I guess even, even farther um, uh, in these uh, particle accelerators, uh, something known as, as hydrogen poisoning has been uh, an issue in these uh, niobium uh, cavities. And so what that means is that um, the bulk niobium cavities uh, absorb uh, hydrogen at, at room temperature. Uh, and then as these systems uh, cool down to cryogenic temperatures, uh, precipitates of, of niobium nanohydrides uh, start to show up near the surface where uh, superconducting currents flow. Um, and so this is uh, known to do a couple things. It, it changes uh, the crystallinity of, of the niobium, um, but more importantly, uh, these defects uh, show up as, uh, as dissipation. So you start to get these kind of pockets of uh, niobium uh, hydrides. And um, what, what, uh, what we see is that um, uh, these uh, hydrides are, are non-superconducting um, and they, they limit high limit quality factors at, at high fields. This is um, uh, kind of these uh, Q degradation curves that, that folks uh, do on, on, on particle accelerators. Um, so the question is like, you know, we have a very similar film um, that, that kind of underpins uh, superconducting qubit technology. Um, and, you know, can we, can we see that um, in that film? So uh, uh, we gave one of our, our chips to, to Fermilab to look at, um, and they were able to apply uh, the tools that they've been using to investigate uh, cavities to, to probe these effects um, in, in transmond physics. Um, and so, uh, you know, what we're mostly looking at um, is a secondary ion mass spe spectroscopy, which tells you about uh, what, what ions and, and what atoms uh, were on your surface. So we'll see a lot of curves like this, where uh, as the, uh, 
uh, probe kind of uh, digs deeper and deeper uh, into the film, uh, we see some uh, surface layer, uh, some bulk layer, and then eventually we get into the silicon. So um, you'll see these curves where uh, the niobium uh, is strong, then it kind of uh, rolls off as well as the silicon uh, down here. So uh, just to give you a, a little snapshot, um, and we do uh, see uh, strong hydrogen peaks um, uh, within the top uh, 10, 20 nanometers um, in a film that you know we're using um, as a kind of R&D uh, characterization, very similar to the kinds of films that, that we actually use uh, day in and day out at Rigetti for our superconducting processors. Uh, so this is a signal that um, there, there's actually quite a bit of hydrogen uh, in these niobium films. Uh, so they took it and they looked, again, with, with tools that were developed for high energy physics, now looking at these you know, QIS device structures uh, with cryogenic AFM. Uh, and you can actually see these little pockets uh, of, of hydrides start to form. Um, this is a, a cryogenic uh, AFM uh, for the cavity. And so these are, these are roughly the, the same size um, and same behaviors as, as we saw in the cavity. Um, now applying uh, X-ray techniques, X-ray crystallography, uh, to look at uh, evidence of um, uh, deformation of, of the niobium uh, crystal plane, we actually see uh, that yes, there is um, you know, quite a bit of hydrogen in these films. Uh, we can confirm that again with um, tools that were developed to understand this effect um, and mitigate this effect for, for high energy physics. For instance, here, uh, dark field TEM. Um, and so atom by atom, we can actually see a grain boundaries, um, different, different phases of niobium uh, hydride. Um, so it's tools like this that are really you know, starting to, to paint a clearer picture of what's going on with, with these films that are really key to the, to the future of uh, QIS science. Um, so I uh, definitely recommend uh, you check out uh, this paper if you're, you're interested in learning more. Um, so you know, going back to uh, you know, really big things um, uh, for a minute uh, as we wrap up, um, you know, Fermilab, uh, this is the, the Tevatron uh, particle collider. It discovered the top quark. Um, so it's a, it's a very uh, important piece of, of Fermilab history. Um, this is the same uh, detector uh, that, that we were looking at. What's really exciting um, as part of the, the five-year mission um, is that uh, the team will actually be um, in the same space that the uh, CDF uh, detector for, for the Tevatron was located, really the same building, reusing the same space and actually reusing the same cryo plant to investigate the limits of cryogenic technology. So um, uh, the team is, is designing uh, this, this kind of very large uh, dilution refrigerator that makes use of this uh, huge investment that's gone into uh, basic uh, high energy physics um, to really understand issues of, of thermalization at scale um, you know, beyond you know, thousands of qubits. Um, so we're very excited to be you know, working with uh, uh, this, this SQMS program to, to really understand, you know, uh, how do we think about uh, constraints uh, from an industry perspective? How do we, you know, tap into and understand some of these, these basic science limits? And that, you know, can inform uh, kind of a, a commercial roadmap towards, uh, towards quantum advantage. Uh, so finally, you know, thanks everybody. Um, it's a busy time and uh, appreciate you coming out. So um, I think we have time for maybe one question. I, I, as a reformed or recovering material scientist, I was very excited to see the hydrogen niobium phase diagram here. But, um, any questions for Matt about SQMS? Is there anything that uh, this afternoon? So as I understand it, uh, to get the two second memory, you store the qubit in a low temperature high Q cavity, right? And mm -hmm. so how does it scale? If you want to store 10 qubits, would you put them in the same cavity or would you have to build 10 cavities? And, um, then, and then how would you access them if you store them in the same cavity? Those are all great questions. Um, there's three different ways that you can scale up you know, these, these 3D cavities. The, the first is the most obvious, you just add 10 cavities. Um, the next most obvious is uh, frequency domain multiplexing. So these cavities are actually multimoded. 
So each one has a resonant, like multiple resonance frequencies, it's kind of a ladder of resonances. Each one of those resonances you can imagine as another mode or another qubit that you could use. The more subtle one is that you can actually um, make use of the harmonic oscillator to pack in um, you know, more qubits into one mode. Um, so um, you can kind of think of the, the number of, of photons that you have in there, take log two of that, and that's roughly the number of qubits that's possible to be stored um, in that mode. So if you can drive the cavity really hard, you know, put in hundreds of photons, you can get kind of tens of qubits into a single cavity. 